A sinister power cloaked in leather and spurred by rebellion emerged from the shadows of the 20th century. The name Hell's Angels alone was enough to strike fear into the hearts of many. Their mysterious leader, Sonny Barger, seemed to live on the outside of society, constantly testing the limits of what was considered acceptable. They made their mark in history with every turn of their turbulent journey, leaving a wake of destruction and unrelenting defiance in their wake. Let's check out what specific actions or decisions did this Hells Angels boss take that made him the most brutal of all the gang leaders. Born in Modesto, California on October 8, 1938, Sonny Barger is a man who defied all odds to become one of the most notorious and celebrated figures in the world of outlaw biker gangs. His mother abandoned him and his father to raise him after four months when she runs off with a Trailways bus driver. His father is a day laborer who spends his nights and most of his money at waterfront bars, often bringing home women and children who have been abused. In 1956, Barger co-founded his first motorbike club, the Oakland Panthers, with a group of fellow military veterans, but things changed for him as he found his true calling in life. Having joined the army with a forged birth certificate and being kicked out 14 months later when his deception was discovered back home, Barger struggled to find his place in the world. Hurry up and barge, one of the most infamous and feared members, Barger eventually becomes president of the Oakland Hells Angels and travels throughout the state of California negotiating territory and alliances with other Hells Angels chapters. However, with great power comes great corruption, and by 1960, the Oakland Hells Angels have established a massive narcotics network, becoming one of the most dangerous drug-dealing organizations in the country. In the early 1960s, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club grew in size and notoriety, becoming one of the most feared outlaw biker gangs in the United States. Along with their increasing notoriety comes an increasing number of run-ins with the law and a growing number of slayings, making Barger a symbol of everything that is wrong with the criminal underworld. Despite Sonny Barger's presence at the Altamont concert and the fact that he was not involved in the stabbing, he was not charged in connection with the incident, the event and the Hells Angels involvement cast a dark shadow over the club's contribution to the concert and the lives of those who attended. Meredith Hunter, 18, was killed when she was stabbed by a Hells Angel after aiming a firearm at the stage. But this was not the end of his brutality. There was one more person who was killed by Barger. Do you know who we're talking about? We will let you know soon, but before that, in the 1970s, there were some other challenges waiting for him. Barger faced more legal trouble and was eventually sentenced to four years in prison for possession of 37 grams of heroin and possession of an illegal firearm. This period marks a turning point for the Hells Angels, as the federal government begins to take a more aggressive stance against outlaw biker gangs, specifically targeting the Hells Angels. Although the legacy stopped him from living life to the fullest, he continues to ride the open road, eventually expressing a preference for high-powered Hondas and BMWs over the Angels' traditional Harley choppers. Through it all, Sonny Barger never loses his edge. He remains a rebel to the end, defying authority and pushing the limits of what is possible. Later in 1972, Barger, along with Hells Angels members Sergey Walton, Donald Dwayne, Whitey Smith, and Oakland Gary Popkin, was accused of murdering Servio Winston Aguero on May 21st. Aguero was a drug dealer from McAllen, Texas, who had traveled to Oakland with a shipment of narcotics for sale. Richard Ivaldi, a prosecution witness, said that he saw Barger shoot and kill Aguero in the bedroom of an absent acquaintance's house, and that Barger then ordered the others to set fire to the building. After a seven-week trial in which Ivaldi's veracity was called into question, Barger and his three co-defendants were found not guilty on December 29, 1972. Sharon Gruhike, Barger's girlfriend, said she was in bed with him at the time of the murder, and thus had no reason to suspect him. So these were some of the ruthless life decisions taken by the founder, Sonny Barger. What motivated him to do that is maybe his will to establish his dominance and fear over others. Let's step into the shadows of the feared Mongols Biker Club, where an enigmatic leader holds all the cards and calls all the shots. Shrouded in mystery, this figure holds sway with an iron fist and strikes fear into the hearts of all. Who is the cunning puppeteer pulling the strings of the Brotherhood's might? Scott Jr. Erickson is the most fearsome Mongol leader ever. 
In the year 1980, Scott Jr. Erickson became a member of the Mongol Motorcycle Gang. He served as president of the National Club four times and saw it expand from a few hundred members in California to thousands of members all over the world. Junior prioritized the Mongols over everything else, demonstrating that the Mongols are more than simply a motorcycle club, they are a brotherhood, which is a large part of the reason the club has become as well known as it is today, a brotherhood for which he had been willing to lay down his life for 30 years. A friend and Junior went fishing at the lake in 1974 when he was very young. A large man with a lengthy beard and hair rode up on a motorcycle and parked it near the lake while they were there. As they watched the rider dismount and light up, they saw that guy was wearing a vest with a Mongols motorcycle club patch. Even though the man was only there for about 10 minutes, the impression he left on 14-year-old Junior, who was there to see it, remained with him forever. Do you know what he did next with his thought? He began daydreaming about owning a Harley-Davidson motorcycle after picking up Easy Rider magazine and reading them religiously. At the age of 18 in 1978, Junior spent $3,400 on a Harley-Davidson Superglide. Not long after arriving in California, he began to hear reports of a bloody conflict between two of the largest motorcycle clubs, the Hells Angels and the Mongols, over the state's territory. Junior began interacting with other club members as time went on. Junior joined the Mongols that day and began participating in weekend riots with them. After a few months, he was invited to the clubhouse of the Mongols' San Diego chapter, where he was formally introduced to the chapter's members and president. Junior's personality and demeanor changed for the worse the day he joined the gang. His brothers had given him a Smith & Wesson 38 Special as an initiation present, and he had grown his hair and beard long. Junior had no fear and thought that he was invincible when he first joined the Mongol Motorcycle Club. But he quickly learned otherwise when three of his brothers were killed in the first year. Two years later, Junior and his brothers got into a fight at a pub with a member of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, and Junior wound up shooting and killing the Hells Angel. Local publications blamed the Mongols Motorcycle Club for the shooting, and the police went on a manhunt for the gang's members when the incident gained widespread media attention. After hearing that three of his brothers had been arrested and charged with first-degree murder and that the police had issued a warrant for his arrest, Junior hastily got out of town, transferred to a Mongol chapter in Tulsa, changed his name, and hid in Oklahoma for six months with the help of his Mongol brothers. Junior's arrest didn't come long after. In 1986, at the age of 26, Junior was paroled out of prison. He was happy to be out of prison, but he was unhappy with the conditions of his parole, which stated that he was not to have any contact with any member of the Mongols Motorcycle Club for one year, and if he did, he would be sent back to prison. Unwilling to turn around, to comply with his parole, Junior got a lawful job, but the day he was released, he reconnected with his brothers and almost immediately became the vice president of the Mongol San Diego chapter. A year later, he was asked to become the Mongols' national president, making him the youngest national president in the club's history. As time went on, Junior became increasingly devoted to the Mongols, to the detriment of nearly all of his other connections. In 1998, Junior and one of his club brothers were out at a pub when they were attacked by a man wielding a knife. To defend themselves, Junior smashed a glass over the assailant's head, knocking him out. Junior and his brother thought the incident was over, so they rode off on their motorcycles. However, the man decided to press charges, and a warrant was issued for Junior's arrest a few days later. When he was taken into custody, Junior tried to explain that he had acted in self-defense, but the police officers didn't seem to care. After a favorable judgment was overturned and Junior's return to jail was ordered, the parole officer found that he had breached his parole. Junior became a folk hero in the Golden State because he tirelessly fought for the rights of Mongols everywhere.